Joel Embiid is late to the party and every party, I guess, according to Tyrese Maxey. The Cavs are unbeaten no more, and Dalton Connect has La La Land going gaga. That's all ahead today on Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA, and we've got a fun one, folks. Lots to talk about. Thanks for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is sponsored by Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On NBA and get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the fifty dollar bonus. It is guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. I'm Doug Branson, host of the Locked On Hornets podcast and your shot clock Sherpa, guiding you through the NBA's biggest stories every day with the help of Locked On's local experts. And with me are two of Locked On's premier national NBA experts from the Locked On Nuggets podcast and senior writer for the Action Network. We've got Matt Moore and from the Locked On Bulls podcast, it is Hayes. Uh, we've, I mean, this is a packed show. The Cavs' unbeaten streak is over. Dalton Connect set, set the nets on fire for the Los Angeles Lakers. LaMelo Ball got benched by his first-year head coach. Shaq might not be back to inside the NBA. I mean, it's crazy out there, but we got to talk about this 76ers drama, which we touched on in the last episode, but it was breaking as we ended that episode. Struggling at 2-11 and right now, the 76ers, the star trio yet to play together. They held a tense team meeting to address their issues, highlighted by Tyrese Maxey reportedly calling out Joel Embiid for being late to everything. The meeting revealed cracks in leadership and urgency amid a rocky start. Before we hear from Locked On 76ers, though, I want to catch up with you guys since we've had some time to digest all of this. Matt, what are your thoughts? I've just been really curious about who leaked it. That's always my first question in these things is who leaked it, right? Uh, Some people noted that the phrase elephant in the room was used, which is a (laughs) phrase that Nick Nurse has used in the past. Now, that's a pretty common phrase. I don't think that that's necessarily ties Nurse immediately to this. And I don't think Nurse came out great in the article because the players were calling out different things about the coaches. But I do think um, there are some interesting kind of ideas of what was the purpose of the leak? That's always what I think of with these stories. From there, I'm just I'm impressed with Maxi for taking the leadership. And I'm trying not to do what is the impulse for me, which is to be like, how are you going to win a championship with Joel Embiid if you're having these problems at this point in his career? I'm trying very hard to resist that, Hayes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the thing that concerned me the most about what came out, like uh, Tyrese Maxey calling out Joel Embiid being late. Okay, that, that's good. I'm, I'm glad Maxey's finding his voice and speaking out. The thing that really concerned me in this report was that Joel Embiid said, hey, I'm kind of confused by what you got, by what we're trying to do out there on the basketball court. That's the thing that really surprised me in, in that report because it's like, Joel Embiid, you should know better than that. Like, I I would expect, I just maybe I just hold Joel Embiid to our standard. Like, he's a smart basketball player. I wouldn't expect him to be kind of caught off guard by what they're doing when a lot of their actions and things are, are the same as yesterday. Yeah, they have new players, but like, for you to be confused by the plays you're running is a little bit of a concern to me there, but uh, outside of that, Maxi, he, he spoke up like he needed to speak up. I liked his follow-up comments as well afterwards with the athletic in which he said he basically spoke up because somebody needed to do it. But the, the coaching staff, the players asking to be coach harder, the coaching staff saying they basically need more from the players. It, it is a lot of dysfunction going over there in Philly, and they need to get this thing corrected before January because I don't know if you guys have looked at their schedule in January. If they don't write this shit by then – that's where you're going to start saying the season's lost. They they got a month to do it. They need to do it by then. All of this reminds me of the the office episode where the three guys are all pointing finger guns at each other. Like it's just everyone. Yeah, exactly. It's Embiid and Maxi and Nick Nurse and somewhere Paul George. I, Paul George is not in the room. He's just somewhere else entirely. I don't know what's going on there. Paul, okay, Paul let's, George is hanging out, being like, I just wanted to stay in L.A. That was all I wanted. <laughs> just wanted to stay in L.A. Paul George is in there saying, Hey, I'm getting my check. That's all I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, well, let's hear from uh, Locked On 76ers. Uh, they had a little bit of a debate about Tyrese's, Tyrese Maxey's role in all of this. Let's take a listen. This isn't something that I want to hear coming uh, that a guard who, don't get me wrong, a max player himself, an all-star, but you don't want to have to hear that he has to tell the franchise player that you have to be on time for meetings and how it's impacting the team. 
because Joel Embiid was supposed to be the guy. Once he came back, everything was going to get right. I understand what you're saying from the perspective of saying you really need to call out your franchise guy and tell him to show up. We, we don't love that. We don't want to see that. But what I do love is that Tyrese Maxey is taking some initiative and saying, I don't care if I'm not the franchise player. I'm an integral part of this team. People are going to listen to me because people are as just annoyed with you as I am right now because you're not showing up and playing your part like the rest of us have to do and show up to work on time. It doesn't matter how much you're getting paid. And maybe this extension is going to Joel Embiid's head. Who knows at this point? Because if he does not turn this around after this conversation in the locker room with this news just dropping, it's going to be trouble in Philadelphia. Important to note, as a lot of the reports did, that Maxi and Embiid were close. So that kind of gives you some signal there to Maxi's role in all of this. But the, the question is, is it his responsibility at this time to take the leadership reins and force some functionality, or, or should it have been a different voice, Hayes? It needs to be whoever it's going to be. I believe that leaderships are forged in times like this. So we can talk, make a conversation of should it have been Embiid or should it have been Paul George's veterans. But you know what? I'm actually appreciative that it is the young guy who was an all-star. It is the reigning most improved player of the year. I'm glad that it is because for him to be the one that's sitting on the sidelines, him even saying that, hey, I, I saw some stuff against us in Miami and we kind of laid down. We have to be better than that. Somebody has to hold this team to the standard. And if it is Maxi, so be it great. Because Joel Embiid, he's already, like, Joel Embiid likes playing games out there. Like, he, he, he he's a goofy guy. Um, but sometimes, like, as much as the reports have been that he's been coddled by uh, Philly, somebody needed to speak up. I'm glad it was Maxi. I've asked a lot of uh, teammates of great players this, from Denver to, K like, guys that played with KD and LeBron. And I've asked, like, okay, what is it that impresses you most about playing with this guy. And they never say the on-court stuff. They say, man, it's his, work it's his work ethic. Like, he's always the last one in the gym. He's the first one to show up. He works, and he sets such an example that helps us get there because he knows what it takes to be great. Hearing this about Embiid, that's just very concerning that he doesn't have that same kind of approach, especially at this point in his career. I I'll credit Maxi here. This is exactly what you want to see, is that being if nobody's going to step up and lead, I'll do it. And taking that kind of initiative, I think, is really great for a young player in this league. Finding his voice, taking that charge, that's great. But I cannot help but just continuously be like, how are you going to win if you cannot count on your best player to set the tone for the rest of the organization? And it feels like Maxi may have had to do this because of past ignoring things in the past with Embiid on an organizational level. And finally you have another max player and has to step up and say something. Uh, so whenever this kinds of thing happens, when a team with superstars starts to show the cracks in the seams, things start to come apart. You've got NBA front office vultures ready to pounce and take advantage of it. And uh, it's a conversation that locked on heat had, and they proposed a trade idea Embiid for bam. Let's take a listen to that conversation. The idea of Bam for Joel is interesting. Bam might have a ceiling. Bam might be just a glorified role player. And certainly a lot of the fan base sees that or believes that after what they've witnessed this year. But you counter that with the fact that he does almost everything well else well. Like he's a model citizen. He's a cornerstone, a building block for any franchise around the league. He shows up on time. Defense, shows up on time. Always breaks hard. Joel Embiid, an MVP player, level player. A guy who can score falling asleep will flop his way to 20 points and, you know, is a, a great all-time player. Is this Embiid going to be Miami Heat Shaquille O'Neal where there's a couple of more big-time years where he could be a cornerstone of a championship-winning team? Or are we talking more like Phoenix Suns Shaq coming up? Are we entering that stage of Embiid's career? Because if, you, if we are, you don't want anything to do with that. If you're the Miami Heat, you're saying we are going all in with Embiid and Jimmy Butler at 34 years old? This that That's the plan? And that's yeah, that, going to beat the Celtics? No, I don't yeah. think if you're the Heat, you can do it. Okay, Matt, is it a good idea for the Miami Heat or any team to pursue a deal for Joel Embiid if this all comes apart? First off, I don't care if it's the latter part of his career or whatever. Embiid, he's won an MVP, great player. Let's not use the word Shaq around Joel Embiid. Let's just not do that. <laughs> um, second, um, you can't do this. You just can't. You absolutely cannot. Let's start right here. You have a guy who has issues with being on time. There's been questions about his conditioning, and you want to bring him to the Miami Heat, the team who is so strict about their conditioning, they won't play guys until they hit certain thresholds. That's not going to work. That goes against everything. Now, Pat Riley is going to be like, I want the star talent, and that's absolutely true, but I just don't know how you can possibly justify this given 
your injury situation. Like you're more likely to wind up in the Sixer situation where multiple guys, Butler and Embiid are out than you are with them winning a title. Uh, it's would be obviously the kind of star that they've been looking for, but they don't have the, honestly, the biggest problem for the heat. They don't have the infrastructure right now to support him. They just don't. This doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, there's always uh, I, shout out to them for the speculation, but Wes, come on, man, F- Phoenix Shack, like, is that the point that we're? Would you, come on, man. Um, but outside of that, like, uh, it's funny that this comes up because isn't Jimmy Butler the last person who tried to hold Joel and Embiid accountable, and they shipped him out like Maxie's doing now? Like, I'm, just, it's just funny there, but. No, come on. You don't want to bring Joel Embiid to Miami unless they plan on Adonis Haslam being the elf on the shelf that constantly follows uh, Joel Embiid around and screams Miami Heat culture at him. No, <laughs> let him stay in Philly. I would love it. It would be entertaining. I think Ben Simmons was the last one to get it, get into it maybe with, with Embiid. And so I, it might be a first and last situation with with Butler, I don't know. Okay, uh, coming up, on, I'm, I'm, I'm sure this is not the last time we're going to talk about this uh, situation with Joel Embiid and the 76ers, so stay tuned. But coming up, the Cavs' unbeaten streak falls, but not without a fight. Did they pass the contender test? And Dalton Connect lights up the Utah Jazz and took down all kinds of Lakers rookie records. But did he do enough to impress Matt and Hayes? Find out next on Locked On NBA. Today's episode of Locked On NBA is brought to you by Price Picks. Price Picks is the best place to get real money sports action with over 10 million members and billions of dollars in award winnings. Price Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. Run your game all season long on Price Picks. Plus, with Price Picks' injury insurance policy, if your player gets hurt in the first half and doesn't return, your lineup stays alive. And thanks to Flex Play, you can still win even if one pick misses. Prize Picks puts their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When my picks hit, I can get my money in as quick as 15 minutes. Think Steph Curry is going to get more than four three pointers next week? How about Anthony Edwards? More than 27 points. Cook up your best hot takes with your friends and win real money this basketball season when you and your crew run your game. Download the app today and use code Locked On NBA to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. That's promo code Locked On NBA to get $50 instantly. Instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Price picks, run your game. More Locked On NBA ahead. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Your favorite NBA team has a free and daily newsletter now. Go to LockedOnDaily.com and subscribe to stay up to date with local expert analysis and amazing writing from Katie Heindel, Mike Shear, and Locked On Fantasy Basketball Tips from Josh Lloyd. Okay, the Celtics ended the Cavaliers' perfect streak at 15 with a dramatic win in Boston. But was this more about Boston's dominance or Cleveland's room for growth? Here's Danny Cunningham from Locked On Cavs breaking down why the Cavs are no longer unbeaten. The idea of Bam. They played at Boston's pace. The one thing that has been kind of a common denominator in those poor performances has been the Cavs have played at the other team's pace. They haven't gotten out and run. They haven't gotten the ball moving side to side. They've gotten too ISO heavy at times. They were down by 21 a couple of minutes into the third quarter because the game was being played the way Boston wanted the game to be played. And I do think that is a good learning experience for the Cavs that they need to continue to, no matter who is on the schedule, they need to play their brand of basketball. It's proven that so far their brand of basketball works. I thought they got back to their brand of basketball in the third quarter against the Celtics. And what happened? They outscored Boston 40 to 28 in that period. And the Cavaliers almost made that comeback a reality in the fourth quarter, thanks to some heroics by Donovan Mitchell. Uh, Hayes, did we learn more about the Celtics or the Cavaliers um, in this big NBA Cup game? I don't think we learned anything much more about either team, at least not for me, than what I thought about them coming into this game. Uh, the Boston Celtics still missing Kristaps Porzingis. The Cleveland Cavaliers were missing Karis LeVert and, and Dean Wade. And I think when you look at the way the Boston won this game with the crazy shooting that they have from three, even though they've been crazy shooting from three all season long, I believe they set a record last night um, in how many threes they made over a 15 game stretch. Um, but it, it, this team went, it, game went down to the wire. Jason Tatum played amazingly well. Uh, Boston Celtics are still the team to beat in the Easter Conference, which we knew coming into this. And the Celtics are a team that 
you know, they competed right there with Boston. So in my opinion, I didn't learn anything more about either one of the teams. And I don't mean that as a negative. I just mean that they were who I thought they were coming into this game. And they're both two damn good teams that are going to battle it out in the Eastern Conference. And it was a fun game to watch. Look, this is going to sound like I'm being contrarian and just forcing a hot take, but I really do genuinely believe this. I'm downgrading the Celtics a little bit here. So they give up a 120 offensive rating to the Cleveland Cavaliers, and the Cleveland Cavaliers did not shoot 14 of 22 from three-point range and a half. Like, if you look at this, the Celtics last year were able to win by margin even when the threes didn't drop as much. They're still always going to be dependent on that because they take so many of them. You miss more shots than you make on, on the hole, and you're not going to win the game. But if we kind of look at this game and we go, wait, okay, so Boston shoots outrageously well. They have this massive lead. And this is still a two-point game going down in the fourth quarter at home without three wing defenders. Cleveland learned more from this matchup about how to defend Boston without some of their best defenders than Boston did. I'm not saying the Cavs are better. I'm not saying the Celtics shouldn't be favorites, but you should not walk away from this game being like, yeah, the Celtics are still way above everybody else. And you add in Chris Porzingis, I get it, but the Cavs match up better because of their bigs with KP. This is a very tight matchup. I hope we get this in the Eastern Conference Finals. Well, that was going to be my next question. I mean, so the Cavaliers come into this game, they were unbeaten. They kept winning uh, and winning in different ways. uh, But a lot of people looked at the schedule and said, I'm not ready to like commit to them being contenders. Hayes, after this game, after seeing the way the Cavaliers fought back in this game, are you ready to declare them a contender in the Eastern Conference? Did they pass the test? In some ways, yes. Uh, I think absolutely when you look, especially that 40-point quarter in, in the third quarter from them at a time where they could have let that game get away. So in some ways, yeah, I still think overall, like I still just need to see it sustained more over time. And that's just, I would say that about any team. It's not a bias against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Like this is not to say they haven't been a good team over the last few years, but um, I just want to see a little bit more tests. And I think that's natural and and an okay thing to say, but I tell you what, the way that they competed last night for Boston, the differential that they've had so far in the season, how they're killing teams. um, They're definitely on that precipice of me saying that they're the contender to come, a contender to come out the Eastern conference. Look, I, I want this team to be a contender. I think it'd be a great story and it'd be a make for a better storyline in the Eastern Conference. But I will just say this, like in that fourth quarter or third quarter where they outscored him 40-28, the Celtics still shot five of 10 from three. Cleveland is not going to adjust much in a regular season matchup. No team is, but they're going to have to show me that they can actually cater a game plan to what they're facing. Because last night, you they almost won that game with them shooting that many threes, you have to work on the volume. You've got to change up your approach. You can't play your base defense versus the Boston Celtics. You have to invert everything and guard the threes first. Until they show me they can do that, I'm going to be a little bit skeptical of of Cleveland. Okay, let's move on uh, to the Los Angeles Lakers. They get another win. They're sixth straight and another win in the NBA Cup as they march towards uh, what could be a repeat in the NBA Cup. But that's not the big story. The big story was Dalton Connect. His record-breaking performance against the Jazz has Lakers fans and LeBron James buzzing about his potential as the steal of the draft. Here's what the host of Locked On Lakers, uh, here's the host of the Locked On Lakers with the numbers to know and why they are all in on Dalton. 37 points. He had 21 of them in the third quarter. Nine threes, the most ever for a Laker rookie. He tied an NBA rookie record in the process for threes. He's the fourth Laker ever to hit nine threes in a game. Uh, Just an absolutely spectacular night, complete with the MJ shrug. And he earned all of that showmanship. We're like one more of these, I think, away from Connectomania in LA if we're not there already. Connectomania running wild in Los Angeles. Uh, Matt, did they get the steal of the draft in Dalton Connect? Oh, man, that's tough. I mean, he was drafted at a pretty low spot, right? And we got a long way to go. I think Jared McCain's 17th. probably going to be in that. What? He was drafted 17th, yeah. Yeah, I think Jared McCain, I think for the, the Sixers are probably is probably going to be in that conversation, too. I think Connect's going to be good. He's also just going to get more attention because it's the Lakers. And so he gets more attention because of that. Still averaging 11 points on the season. The competition has not been exactly fierce, but it's a rookie. So like he's going to be a good player and he's going to be really good for for the Lakers. I don't know if there's a superstar booming here, but it's a really good start for him. Great start for, for Dalton Connect. You look at uh, but he went to a team with 
Anthony Davis and LeBron James and he's able to slide into a role and also he's coaching for I mean his coach is one of the best three-point shooters that we've ever seen so like I mean he went to a situation where yeah it's good they're going to be able to maximize and they need exactly what he brings and I don't mean that as a slight but to say that he's going to be the still of the draft I think it's too early to say for sure a lot of the players in, in this draft are really just now starting to find their stride as well, where some just aren't going to probably play a lot this rookie year, but connect is going to be a good player. Like I, I, I don't have any doubt that the floor is very high for Dalton connect. He's going to be a really good player. It may just be a good role player in this league, but I'm not willing to say much like Matt, that he's, he's on the precipice of being a star or anything like that, but being in LA playing with AD playing with LeBron, uh, being able to have that pressure off of him connects going to be good this season. And, you know, definitely some defensive issues with this game. But if he's going to score like that, he's going to start attracting defensive attention from the other team, which is only going to help uh, LeBron and AD. So it'll be interesting to watch that. And then LeBron asked about it after the game. Uh, I'm paraphrasing LeBron here, but he essentially said, you guys think I lie all the time, but I watched a lot of UT basketball. So he wasn't surprised by uh, Connect here for the Los Angeles Lakers. Okay. Coming up, LaMelo Ball benched by his first-year head coach inside the NBA lives, but it might be without one of its biggest stars. And the Suns owners, uh, owner talks KD's future in Phoenix. Are these something to be worried about or nothing to see here? We play Is It Something next on Locked On NBA. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. The FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get that hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You're going to get started with $150 in bonus bets. Uh, Maybe you can place some of those bets on the Rookie of the Year campaign. I mentioned in the last show, Jared McCain jumping up the rankings, but don't connect. Might have something to say about that after 37 points for the Lakers. Um, If you win your first $5 bet, you're going to get $150 in bonus bets at FanDuel.com. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. More Locked On NBA ahead. Thanks again for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. There is a free daily Locked On podcast for your favorite NBA team. Search your favorite podcast app for Locked On and your favorite team today. A lot happens in the NBA every day. That's why we do this show. And some of those things mean something, and sometimes they mean nothing. And here to help us tell the difference are Matt and Hayes in a little game of Is This Something?, And our first topic is going to be LaMelo Ball and the Charlotte Hornets. LaMelo Ball benched in the fourth quarter of a tight NBA Cup game. The Hornets only losing by one against the uh, against the Brooklyn Nets. LaMelo has been one, if not the best scorers in the fourth quarter. Charles Lee is a first year head coach for the Hornets with championship credentials, but he was brought in to bring some accountability to a young team that hasn't won a playoff series in over 20 years. Hayes, is this benching of LaMelo Ball in the fourth quarter something or is it nothing? I I think it was the right decision. I don't think it's something unless it turns into something like, for example, I don't mean to link everything back to the Bulls, but like Billy Donovan bit Zach Levine once. It took took Zach Levine four years to get over that benching reportedly, so it could turn into something. But overall, it was the right decision to make. He was three for 13, and this team lost to a Brooklyn Nets team that didn't even have Cam Thomas. So, yeah, when your best player is playing bad, despite him being a great scorer with it, I think that it does send a message. And to your point, he's, he's brought there to bring some accountability. You need to hold p- players accountable. And I, I think that sends a message, uh, could be send a positive message to the rest of the roster of, you, you, you got to be locked in. We need you to be locked in. That's my opinion. I think it's something. I think it's what it is. I think it's a crossroads for LaMelo, which is I've mm-hmm. had this kind of issue of, I think his, his talent is undeniable, but he does not play a disciplined tight game where the good stuff from LaMelo is so good. He's got he's such a great passer. He's got such great vision. He is a three-level scorer. But he is lazy with the shot selection. He's careless with the ball 
and it can really cut and he's a bad defender and those three things can cost you and if you're trying to build accountability in the franchise you have to take opportunities like this to try and generate that from a guy who needs to be that guy because otherwise you wind up and it's five years later and your younger guard is calling out the superstar in the locker room wait no that's the sixers again so I, <laughs> i'm just trying to say this is an opportunity for Lamelo to make the jump in maturity as a as an nba leader and be like i will be better so I, that doesn't happen or he can respond by holding it against lee and feeling like it's outrageous and fuel his individual game but that's not going to get him where he needs to go self-reflection is hard for nba players because they're so good and they've gotten and confidence is so important but this is an important crossroads i think for Lamelo. I just hope he knows what he's doing in, in terms of Charles Lee because uh, this is really early in the season. I don't know, you know, where their relationship is if it's if it's strong enough to endure something like this. I hope he has the support of the franchise because otherwise he just opened up a huge can of worms. Lamelo Ball is on a max contract, and typically guys that are on max contracts that are regarded as the star of the team don't sit in the fourth quarter of a tight game, particularly when they've been playing well just by the stats. Because I agree I mean, with everything you're saying there, Matt, on the maturity issues and the the game discipline issues. It's just like there are NBA politics to all this as well. Oh no, Lamelo might get mad and they might lose games because of it. Wait, they're five and nine and would have one of the worst point differentials in the league. Uh, totally. They're also a franchise that has been talent deficient for a very long time, and so that's where all of this gets really complicated. Like if, if this were an issue for. Uh, the Lakers or the Knicks or the Sixers, guys, the teams that can bring talent in, it's less of an issue, I think. And I know we got to move on, but I do want to kind of note this. A big part of what I heard was that the Hornets were looking to fix the culture problem in the locker room. And that was a big reason why they hired, hired Charles Lee. And then they completely ignored that and brought back Miles Bridges. But anyway, like they're trying legitimately to change the culture here. You can't have a coach and tell him that's what you want and then not give him the tools to do so. So on some level, Lee's got to be like, I'm doing what you hired me to do. Yeah, it's go It's going to get very interesting uh, for a team, again, that has not won a playoff series in 20 years. Okay, inside the NBA, let's move to the entertainment section of the show. Inside the NBA will be back next season, but not on TNT. It's going to be on ESPN. But interesting note here in the celebrations of that show being back is that one of the members, Shaq, his contract isn't entirely buttoned up. Will all of this get figured out? Is this something to pay attention to, Matt? I think it's probably nothing. I think it's probably just like he's he's in a position to leverage, so he's going to leverage, right? I think Barkley and, and Kenny are probably a little bit more like, I just want to keep doing the job because we've done it for so long and we're iconic. Shaq's about optimizing his earning potential. That's, you know why he's in a million commercials uh and so <laughs> there's kind of like i i think it's likely that he's going to be back which i'll be honest with you i think that shaq's great in some circles i think the show was better before shaq showed up i think that show Whoa! Better. oh wow look he the, the before they actually were a little bit more serious it wasn't constantly the talk about barkley not winning a title it wasn't quite as ridiculous like that show has a had the right mix of ridiculousness and Shaq took the ridiculousness to Shaq levels and Shaq's such a big personality it's hard to contain I liked I'm old enough to remember the show before it I kind of liked it better before so much like the uh the Clippers championship chances this is nothing um <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get that drop <laughs> gotta get it oh um, because no no they're gonna work this out i think that you know they're gonna work this out they're gonna want Shaq to be there the whole thing is they're gonna have the whole they're already gonna be missing ernie apparently right so they're gonna want the whole team there i think the espn is gonna want the personality of Shaq to help sell that show i i, I think they'll get it all worked out with before time i thought ernie was coming back was that oh is he coming I, back did I oh miss great that? I, I think all three of them because it's all going to be produced in atlanta by the by the same crew so i think that's one of the things that espn's bring getting into the aggregation game by the way between omaha and this they're basically outsourcing their content which i think is pretty interesting which is probably good for them so yeah. can the clippers outsource their talent that's the two question. that's two <laughs> yeah, wow yeah you're you're over indexed on on clippers uh clippers takes here okay uh, the Suns are trying to insource Kevin Durant, according to their owner, Matt Ishbia, who told ESPN that he expects to sign Kevin Durant to a contract extension next offseason. And he wants the 14-time All-Star to retire as a Sun, saying, quote, Kevin wants to be here. We want Kevin here. There's never been one grumbling of anything different, unquote. 
Uh, this is what what's the thing? The T-shirt uh, is should be answering the questions here. But I just feel like this is like when you say there's never been one grumbling, yeah. I feel like that throws up some red flags. But is this something or is this nothing, Hayes? Uh, who knows? Like Kevin Durant could wake up tomorrow and decides he wants to go play in Never Never Land. I, I don't know with Kevin, Kevin Durant. Can you ever trust him to stay in a franchise? Like I, I, I think at the end of the day, he's probably going to stay there with, with the Suns. I think that they are going to be motivated. The owner's going to be motivated to keep him there. They're basically going to give Kevin Durant anything he wants. He'll sign that contract. The question is going to be, though, is he going to be on that team by the end of that contract? I think it's the better, better, bigger question here. I think this is always fascinating because, like, look, people around the league are constantly like, keeping an eye on KD, and they'll say, like, no, like, I've heard that he's very open and, like, might want to leave. And the question there is, is this wishful thinking trying to, like, project it forward? Because that happens a lot. I'll, I will go ahead and say that this is something in that I don't think KD leaves. I think KD is going to retire as a son. I think they're going to have a really great season. They might make the Western Conference Finals or further once they get healthy. I think this team is in the position to do that. I think right now is, like, they're under the radar because of the injuries. And I think that's going to push KD to probably finish his career with Phoenix. I think this is the spot where I think he's just finally like, I don't see the point in, in doing this again. He's jumped so much. I think KD's finally ready to just be somewhere, and I think it's going to be Phoenix. And there's one way and one way only to seal the deal. That's right, folks. They got to build a statue of Kevin Durant <laughs> as part of the resigning. I have a statue of him that's tweeting. Right. At exactly. Me. Yeah, Something looking mean. down at <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll talk much more about KD and the Suns as Kevin Durant, you know, looks to get back uh, after that eight and one start for the Suns, and then getting injured. I know Suns fans; uh, they talked about it today, actually, on Locked On Suns, what they've been missing with Kevin Durant, what they hope they can get back uh, when he returns. So definitely check that out. If you like what you heard on this podcast today, make sure to subscribe to Locked On NBA wherever you get podcasts. That includes on YouTube. If you want to see all three of our bright shining faces. Uh, subscribe, like, tell a friend. Thanks for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. Enjoy tonight's action. Be kind to each other. And we're going to see you right back here on Thursday's Locked on NBA.